Deputy on City Service. I'm City Councilor Marianne Labarge, Chair, and I will call the City Service Committee to order. I am recorded to announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Joining me is City Councilor from Ward 2, Karen Foster, Vice Chair, City Councilor Michael Quinlan from Ward 1, and City Councilor Rachel Muir from Ward 7. Laura, will you please call the roll? Sure. Councillor Labarge. Here. I'm Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Foster. Here. And Councillor Quinlan. Here. Next on the agenda is public comment. Is there any, many, any member of the public who would like to address the committee on any subject? There is. No one present. No members of the public present. There is no public comment. Okay, number four, previous, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, minutes of November 2nd, 2020. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion made and a seconded. Is there any discussion? Um, Roll call, Laura. Me. Um, Councillor uh, Foster? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. And Councillor Quinlan? Yes. We've been joined by one other person, Councillor Labarge. I don't know if they're interested in public comment, but just wanted to alert you to their presence. Um, and I can't see uh, who it is. It's YP. That's all you I'm want me to ask if they'd like to make a public comment? Yeah, please. I don't even know if I can unmute them, but let me actually, they don't have I don't, a yeah, they don't have a microphone, so I don't see a way to unmute them, so. Oh, no, now, now there's one, interesting. Oh, okay, you're right. Connecting to oh. audio, and it, so it's just connected. Ah, oh, okay. Um, let me see, individual with the um, identifying, Letters YP would did you were you interested in making a public comment? Just checking in. Oh no, I wasn't. Thanks for asking. Okay, thanks. Okay, sorry, Councillor Labarge. We're all set. Yes. Okay. So the next item, um, an update on DPW seasonal preparations and an overview of solid waste collection disposal system. We are joined today by department head, Donna Liscalia, Department of Public Works. We have invited department head, Donna Liscalia, to help us counselors learn more about the behind the scenes operation of this large department and how it is operating since you had to transition your department to remote operation following the shutdown in March. I'm going to start by turning the floor over to department head Donna Liscalia so she can update us on her department activities. Donna, us counselors do have specific questions for you once you have finished your information. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, counselor. Um, You're welcome. Hi to everybody. Um, I have a, uh, a remote hotspot here that looks like this. So if you cannot hear me, please let me know and I will try something different. Sometimes my connection gets a little strange. Um, so <laughs> if, if it starts to cut in and out, please let me know. But that's what I'm working off of. So, um, so it has been asked of me that I talk a little bit about transfer station operations and snow. Um, so in no particular order, I guess I'll start with transfer station operations and just give a very brief overview um, so that, uh, um, it, you know, and then I'll take uh, whatever questions you have. So um, we operate two residential transfer stations in the city. There's um, tends to be a lot of misunderstanding about what the DPW is actually in charge of as it relates to trash within the city limits. Um, so once the landfill closed some years ago, um, uh, solid waste really changed within the city. So uh, what we offer is a, a transfer station solution for residents only. We do not offer solutions for businesses, commercial, industrial. Um, we do not offer or control curbside pickup in any way. So what we do is we run transfer stations. We run one at Glendale Road 
and we run one at Locust Street. Um, so what we take at, at Locust Street is just regular household trash. We take recycling. We also do food waste, uh, compost. We take um, various hazardous materials like antifreeze, automotive oil, like um, the old thermometers that have mercury in them. Um, some, we have a scrap metal dumpster. Um, so pretty much anything you have laying around the house, we can take it at uh, Locust Street. And we also have a transfer station on Glendale Road and there we receive bulky waste like uh, you know, mattresses or furniture that you don't want. We also have a leaf and yard waste collection that's open seasonally. Um, so when we think about the number of households in Northampton that actually partake in our services, uh, there has been a downward trend for the last decade um, to the point where we're now taking, uh, we, or, or let me rephrase that, we sell uh, just under 3,000 permits a year. So that's under 25% of the households in Northampton. So be, because there is a lot of choice about how to uh, engage in getting rid of your trash. Uh, people definitely exercise that choice. And so we have seen a steady decline in the last decade in households who come to our facility at Locust Street. So there's an access fee of $45 um, and that gets you access to both of our facilities and all the services uh, that exist. And then you have to buy the trash bags. Um, separately, but you know, Valley Recycling is an option for people. Curbside uh, pickup from any one of a number of haulers is an option, and, and people definitely partake in those options. Um, so, uh, again, we're controlling less than 25% of the household's trash within the city. Um, so, what does that actually look like? Um, we took in uh, about 300 tons of, of recyclables last year, uh, 505 tons of, of paper and cardboard, 103 tons of metal, 192 tons of compost, and 864 tons of trash. So most notably, um, you know, when we think about uh, solid waste as an enterprise fund, because that, that's what it is, you know, money in needs to equal money out. What we have seen is with the decline of people actually using the service at the transfer station, uh, we have an imbalance in the enterprise. And so we have engaged in a lot of activities over the past couple of years to try to stabilize the enterprise. Um, but it primarily by adjusting fees, which had not been adjusted since 2011. Um, but we also have, it, I will add, um, the, the least expensive municipal transfer station sticker fee regionally. Um, we have the, um, you know, kind of geographical proximity of Valley Recycling to us, which just sort of is what it is. And it gives people an option of a place to go to that, that does not have an entrance fee. And that's the way that they're structured and that's not something that the city control, but um, you know, they, they have definitely cut into the market share, if you will. Um, and, and so when we think about how to stabilize the enterprise, we're dealing with competition, um, which, was, which is sort of uh, unusual um, for, for municipal transfer station. Um, and we're also dealing with external market forces that we can't necessarily control, like um, you know, the price of receipts Recyclables. So, you know, there, there were two really significant things that happened for the city um, this calendar year in 2020. The first was that, you know, we went from being paid for our recyclables to having to pay to dispose of them to the tune of, of well over $100,000 a year. So that was a significant expense for us. And, and not only that, our longtime comp compost contract expired. Um, you know, so we'd been working off the same compost contract for five years. And of course, like, you know, the contract's up, so the fee goes up. Um, so, you know, we have sort of external factors that we had to deal with. And then we had the COVID crisis, um, which, you know, for anyone who has been to our transfer station, you know that we're dealing with an extremely small, tight footprint of a transfer station that is literally operating in the middle of my highway operation. So, it, you know, people are trying to dispose of their kitchen trash and we're trying to get a snowplow on a truck, like in the middle of this, you know, so we've got this very, very tight area we have all of these containers sort of stacked next to each other. 
Um, you know, we were having a very difficult time maintaining the necessary social distancing because you have just this constant, you know, traffic and people crisscrossing and, you know, everyone's in a hurry. Of course, no one really wants to hang around at the transfer station. We had a lot of traffic congestion. We had uh, tempers start to flare. We had multiple disturbances that, that were starting to become uh, alarming in nature. Um, and, and so what we did, and I don't know if anyone has, has been to the transfer station lately, but we, we actually um, completely redesigned how the transfer station was laid out. We spread everything out. Um, moved the containers so that we can actually pull the containers from behind the building. So I'm actually only pulling one container. It's the paper compactor now from within the transfer station, because what was happening is people were driving or, or people were both driving and walking around our roll-off truck. So we're trying to pull the container and people are like crisscrossing behind the container and like somebody was really going to get hurt. So we had to redesign, you know, how we were operating. Operating. Um, but what that did is it actually necessitated me putting two employees on duty instead of one employee because everything is now so far apart and so spread apart that the employees actually can't cover the ground that they used to be able to cover and operate the compactor, you know, in two different places simultaneously if we get a slug of cars. So, you know, we have a lot of challenges that are really unique to how we are operating in the footprint that we're operating in you know if i could snap my fingers we would have like three times as much room as we actually have but you know we've done the best we can to kind of put things you know where they belong to make this easy so that's the solid waste uh overview and i can move right to snow operations if you want and talk about that or i can take questions on solid waste or whatever is your pleasure counselor whatever the commission would like to do. Councillor Quinlan. Thank you. Uh, I, well, I, I'm there every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, a weekly user of the transfer station on Locust Street. Uh, and so I did notice all of this that you're talking about, all the redesign, kind of the trenching for the um, recyclable container uh, and all of that going on. You know, I'm, I'm there as a weekly observer, but you're right, not, not hanging around too long. Um, but at the same time, I, I thought that that was pretty interesting. And I wanted to ask, because at one point, I know that in June, we discussed this around the budget, uh, having a police officer there almost all the time, but that doesn't seem to be happening anymore. Um, so I wanted to just check in with you on that so I would understand that. Yeah, so I, as I mentioned, it, you know, when COVID sort of first set in and, and we you know, had uh, limits on the number of cars they could get into the transfer station at one, at one time, you know, I had disturbances at the transfer station that were very, very alarming. Uh, we were really struggling to maintain um, peace and, and order. And we were struggling with people sort of obeying very basic instructions from my employees. Um, we actually had to um, pull a restraining order against somebody. Um, we, we got involved in some really significant um, situations which escalated to a very undesirable level um, to the point where my employees actually felt threatened. Um, but, you know, it was, a, I think, a very stressful time, you know, in our country, in our society. And so, you know, when I built the budget for, for this year, the year that we're in now, the fiscal year we're in now, you know, it was very difficult to be able to uh, forecast what was going to happen or how this was going to go or how things were going to unfold. So, you know, I, obviously my priority is we have to keep our services open and running and I need to support my employees and make them feel safe. So, you know, what I asked for was the basically the ability to hire police, you know, when we were open in the event that that was needed uh, to support my employees. And, you know, my strategy all along was, you know, just for I just because, it, you know, we think we might need something three months ago doesn't mean, you know, that, okay, this is just the way we're going to do it. And I'm not going to revisit it. So what I have done is I have actually revisited this on a weekly basis. And since you're there every week, um, you might notice that I actually tapered this down um, over a period of months, uh, to the point where I no longer have police present except on Saturdays. 
Um, and I will revisit this on December 31st because we just took traffic counts and I'm seeing about 1100 cars a day on a Saturday. So that's, that's a lot of people, um, it, you know, in a nine hour stretch, but you know, if, if we sort of spread that over nine hours, you know, it's about a hundred people an hour or, you know, 120 people an hour, something like that. Um, so I, I, am very pleased to report that I've had no further disturbances. The people we trespassed are no longer with us. I revoked a few, um, transfer station stickers, you know, we just send people a letter and say like, you're no longer welcome here. Um, you know, I haven't had any further disturbances. Um, so I'm very pleased with, you know, the traffic flow and how people are treating my employees. It, you know, so I think at this point, I, I do need an officer to direct traffic on Saturdays at the entrance. It, it's just kind of a tricky uh, intersection uh, there. But uh, generally, in terms of, you know, keeping the peace inside the transfer station, I'm very pleased with how that's progressing. And, and it, it does not appear necessary. Um, but, you know, we did have folks who were who were like harassing people. And, and so I did need a police presence um, for that. Uh, thank you for that answer. I appreciate it. And, I, and I'm glad to hear that it's, uh, you know, alleviated some. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Donna, I do have a question for you. You said, what was it? 1,100 cars that come in on a Saturday? Yeah, on a Saturday. Yes. And what about during the week? Yeah, so we pulled traffic counts, it, you know, I, I mean, we obviously changed the schedule this year, you know, so, so we've, you know, we've gone from being open the most hours of any municipal transfer station regionally to still being open um, the most hours of any uh, regional municipal station, but um, you know, we've, we've definitely cut back considerably. Um, so I had taken traffic counts prior and I took traffic counts um, just, I, I don't know, maybe Councilor Quinn, you, you noticed the uh, tubes down by the sand pile um, that when you were going in and out, but I, I wanted to pull counts and just sort of see you know, how the traffic has kind of organized itself over the days that we actually are open. So, um, so what I'm seeing is, is that we're primarily having a pretty good slug of traffic on Saturdays, like 1100 cars. Um, and then I've got like seven, 800 cars the other days, which is exactly what I would expect it, actually. And it, it's pretty evenly spaced. Tuesday's a pretty busy day. Um, Wednesday is a little bit deader, uh, and, and then Thursday is busy. So, it, you know, it's sort of when I think about how we're going to operate moving forward, there's obviously a cost associated with being open, uh, you know, an employee cost and, and energy and so on and so forth and, and trucking, you know, the behind the scenes stuff that happens is, you know, we're open on Saturdays. I have to have employees working on Saturdays. These are union employees. This is a time and a half operation. So, you know, there's sort of the hidden costs of our hours of operation as well. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is pull traffic counts and see, you know, how many cars can I reasonably take on a given day? And then I want to maximize the days that we're open. Um, you know, I think it'd be great if we're open 24 hours a day and someone's always going to want to come, you know, at 2 a.m. or whatever, just because like that works for them. But that doesn't mean we should be open. So, well, um, Dana, are we making money at that transfer station or are we losing money? Well, that's a tricky question, um, but what I can tell you is generally when we look at how the budget was built this year, we are pulling from stabilization in order to balance the budget. Um, so that means that it is a net loss. Um, you know, we have increased the fee that we're charging people for permits. So, you know, we have seen an increase in that revenue, but we've also sold less permits this year. Um, you know, sort of year over year than we did last year. But I, again, you know, all of the enterprises are, are seeing a decrease in revenue. So it's hard to say if, it, you know, what the reason for that is, but we've sold about 200 permits less this year to date than we did uh, the previous year. But with the increase in the fee, we've actually made more money in that. So um, this is definitely not a money maker for us. Um, and, it, you know, again, my goal is to stabilize this enterprise so that we are breaking even. And, and I have to do that through a combination of, of you know, operational tightening of belt and, and um, you know, looking at what our fees are and, and trying to determine the best way to move forward. 
question, Donna, on the recycling part of it. I think I had brought it to your attention once before in regards to, there was an article in the Gazette last fall um, from the mayor of Holyoke, Alex Norris, in regards to that they had a consultant because they were told the cost of recycling to ship out was going to cost the city a lot of money. And they gave a figure of over six hundred and something thousand dollars. Have you heard anything about something like this might be happening with cities? Well, yeah, this is what I referred to when I talked about, you know, where we used to be paid for our recyclables right. prior to July 1st of 2020. It, you know, we used to haul a, a container down to Springfield filled with, you know, plastic jugs and like we would get money for it. Um, so after July 1st of 2020, it, you know, we're now paying $92 a ton to get rid of that. Um, so this was a, a huge shift, you, you know, like, like we're really swinging here um, from, you know, getting revenue to, to paying. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of differences between Northampton's uh, recyclables and Holyoke's recyclables where, uh, uh, so it, 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 we're not really comparing apples to apples here. You know, Holyoke produces a considerably more recyclable material than Northampton does. Um, and, and I certainly can't speak for their decision making, but what we are finding is since this new contract went into effect on July 1st, you know, what I had asked for from council to approve in the solid waste budget was $110,000 for recyclables, but I'm very pleased to report that the, um, the we're, we're actually getting like, like a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, a, not a charge back, but, but we are getting a benefit for the recyclables that we bring down to Springfield and they're actually paying us more than I thought that they were going to pay us. So, you know, we had thought it was going to be $92 a ton, but they're actually giving us a sort of a discounted rate on that based on the market recovering the, the market for recyclables recovering. So we've actually spent quite a bit less disposing of our recyclables recyclables than I thought we were going to. And if the market continues to improve, you know, ultimately we would not need to budget that significant amount of money. So I'll have to kind of see where we're at in the spring. And when I appear before you, you know, next May to ask you to approve the budget, you, you may actually see a reduction in the line. Oh, great. One more question, Donna. Um, COVID-19. Here we have employees working in the recycling center. Has any of the employees, I mean, I, I'm, here we have residents coming in and using the recycling center, have to wear a mask, six feet distancing. And has any of the employees have been stricken with the COVID-19? It, so I, I do have um, HIPAA laws that I have to adhere to, it, meaning that I, I can't uh, specify which employees no, have, right, right. have gotten COVID or not. What I can tell you is I have had multiple employees in the DPW who have tested positive for COVID. I've also had multiple employees who have had to be quarantined due to close contact with those employees or with people within their own families um, who have tested tested positive um, and and I'll talk about this a little bit when I talk about our snow operations, but it happens very quickly. And so, it, you know, when I lose one person, I lose seven people. Um, and, and so a couple of weeks ago, we actually had seven people out uh, simultaneously due to both positive tests and um, quarantining because of close contact. Um, so yes, this has been very difficult for our operations. We have to adapt. We have to adjust. We have to overcome it. You know, we're fighting the same battle everybody else is fighting. Um, so yes, it has affected the transfer station as much as it's affected every other division in, in, in the department. Anna, I want to thank you very much for answering my questions and, um, Thank you in your department for everything you've been doing. You're welcome. I just had a qu quick question. Sorry to interrupt. Um, about the is so Glendale is open. Uh, the Glendale Road 
facilities open? Glendale's open on Saturdays. On yeah. Saturdays. Thank you. Saturdays. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Dawn. Yep. So I can say a few words about our snow operations now, if if um, if, if that would work. Um, so I'll start by saying that we have 160 miles of roadway that we're maintaining. Um, a lot of municipalities choose to contract out their snow and ice operations. Uh, we do not contract out our snow and ice operations. We supplement with contractors, um, but it has become increasingly difficult to get those contractors. And, and this year in particular, it's, it's really difficult to get contractors. Um, so what we have is 49 plow routes. We have the 160 miles of roadway divided into 49 plow routes. Um, 49 plow routes means I need 49 trucks with plows and I need 49 people with a commercial driver's license to drive those trucks. Um, I also have support staff, um, like uh, clerical staff that um, it, you know, logs the roads as they've been plowed and communicates with the drivers. I have uh, multiple supervisors who have to be on duty, including a highway superintendent who's, who oversees the entire operation, but we have foremen and general foremen. I also have the fleet mechanics who have to be present because things break constantly. Uh, we also have to have a uh, contingent of people available to drive loaders and specialty equipment. Um, so it's not just the plows, it's, it's the loaders that are loading the salt into the sanders on the back of the plow um, and the other specialty equipment that, that is needed to, to remove the snow once it gets stacked up. So when we think about how many employees are involved in the snow operation, we're, we're probably in the mid 60s. Um, you know, one of the things that was a fairly significant topic of conversation during the override conversation is why does the DPW have all of these trucks and why are all of the trucks new? And, you know, what I would say to people is we have 160 miles of roadway that we're maintaining. We have 49 plow routes. Um, so I, I think everyone like has a personal car and, and you sort of understand how this works, but you know, the average width of a city street is about 30 feet. Um, you know, we're not just plowing a 10 foot travel lane. We're actually plowing snow from all 30 feet of the road from end to end. Um, you know, we, we can't be running trucks from like the year 2000. Um, they're, they're going to break down. They're not going to be reliable. They're going to drop their transmission. Um, and, you know, when we lose a truck, we have to have a replacement. If we don't have a replacement, we have to be able to fix it and we have to be able to fix it fast or your road doesn't get plowed. So the frustrating part of the override conversation was people maybe thinking that we shouldn't have the equipment that we have or we have too many trucks or the trucks are too new or we spent too much money on them. And you know what I always tell people is how fast would you like your road cleared? Because we can use a truck that's 20 years old to clear your road, but it's probably going to break and you're going to have to wait for us to fix it. And it could take two hours or it could take two days. Um, so that's kind of the dance that we have to dance. So we have, our fleet has a, a very close to about 200 pieces of equipment, um, it, all of which is active um, because it has to be, uh, because we have to be able to swap out our equipment as it's needed, particularly um, the big jump trucks, the six and 10 wheel dumps that have the sanders mounted in the back. That's what we use to, to salt the city. And that's what pushes the snow on King Street and Florence Road and Route 66 and the big wide roads. We have to have those trucks in order to move that snow load. We cannot plow Route 66 with a pickup truck. It, it would, it, we would destroy the transmission within a half a mile. Um, those trucks cost about $250,000 and um, no matter how well we maintain them, they are very expensive to fix. Um, so, you know, as I said, we typically have about 65 people in for any given snowstorm. This is very challenging uh, during COVID because I need to keep everybody separated. I don't want people, um, you know, swapping equipment. The more I have people driving everybody else's equipment, the more potential I have for, you know, transmitting the virus or who's sick or who's not or whose husband or wife is sick. And, 
And um, so, you know, it's, it, we've had to be, it, it's sort of like doing a giant logic puzzle to try to figure out how to keep everybody separated and, and how to give everyone, you know, their own vehicle so that um, there doesn't have to be uh, swapping. Um, so the way we run our operation is that, um, you know, I, we will monitor the weather uh, forecast, you know, days in advance. Um, I, I, I'm the one who declares the snow emergency. So when you get that 911 call, I'm the one behind it. Um, and, you know, I always try to err on the side of caution because if I don't declare a snow emergency and we can't salt the road because people's cars are parked on top of it, and, you know, I go and lose the city um, because I can't get salt on the roads, I'm ultimately the one that's responsible for that. So, it, you know, a lot of people like to uh, sort of criticize the decision that I make, but I always try to make it um, with, with everybody's safety in mind. And, and we also have to be mindful that, you know, Ward 6 and Ward 7 are at a higher elevation than, than downtown. So it, we have a completely different microclimate going on in Ward 6 and Ward 7 um, that, than we do down in front of City Hall. So I, I sort of have to make uniform decisions. So, um, you know, it might not be snowing at City Hall, but it's, it's snowing up in Leeds. Um, so a typical storm event, we pre-treat all the roads, which means we salt everything um, because we don't want to give the snow an opportunity to bind to the road and then it turns to ice and then you know if we end up with temperatures in the 20s we're just fighting that for days and days and days um, so we pre-treat everything we plow everything uh, and then we'll salt again um, and and you know depending on the duration of the storm we're there before it starts and we're there long after it ends. This time of year, I have a second and third shift on Monday through Friday. So we're staffed 24 seven. Um, and I also have what's called the weekend watch. So I have one person on duty 24 hours on the weekend um, in, in three different shifts. And basically they patrol the entire city in a sander. And if there's ice, they hit it with salt. Um, so how much salt do we use? Um, between 60 and 100 tons in a, a typical snowstorm. If we get an ice storm, we can use between 150 and 200 tons in a storm. We pay $68 a ton for treated salt and our capacity is about 3,500 to 4,000 tons at any time we have on hand. Um, and I stockpile it um, <sighs> just to make sure that there's no supply chain issues. So we have about 3,500 tons on hand right now, which, which would likely get us through the winter um, barring complete disaster. So that is a overview of our snow operations. I will mention um, that we've definitely been affected by COVID and by quarantines. Um, it, you know, an example of that is we were expecting snow over the weekend. So everything was all set. We had the plow routes, we had the trucks, we were all set. And I lost three people just like that. Three plow drivers on Friday to COVID. So, you know, we lose a plow driver, like obviously we need to backfill that. So, you know, this winter is gonna be very challenging and we'll do the best we can. But what I have to do is I have to dissolve that plow route into the plow route next to it. So what we could end up with is, you know, depending on the, the, the extent of the outbreak or depending on, you know, how many people I lose, um, you know, we could end up with some delays in, in clearing roads, um, it, you know, and it's not like I can replace these guys. You have to have a CDL. You have to have a commercial driver's license. You have to be able to operate an air brake. You have to be able to, um, you know, understand what, what it's like to drive a truck in, in the public right away. Um, so it's not like I can just sort of pluck someone, you know, out of the office and throw them behind the wheel of the truck. Um, it's, it's definitely Definitely a skill. So that's the particular challenge with COVID for, for this year. Yeah. Any questions, Counselor? Um, yeah, so I just, I do want to say that whenever we have these DPW briefings, I, I toss and turn a little bit more that night. It happened after our tour. I had like fever dreams about the wastewater treatment plant and the generator. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. I, I'm really glad we. I'm really glad we're having this briefing because, you know, I think one thing we could be doing is I could, you know, give the heads up gently to my residents you know, about possible delays depending on what's happening. Um, we're all just going to have to deal with it. That's just it's an imperfect situation. Um, I guess. Oh, Don, I wanted to ask. Um, so is is basically with the plowing? Is it always overtime? Because you never. It's unpredictable. I mean, you don't. I guess you know a little ahead of time whether you're going to have to plow, but is it basically considered like an overtime or 
so the way the the way the union contracts are written yeah. is that the union employees regular hours are 7 a.m to 3 p.m monday through friday okay. anything outside of that is overtime except oh, okay. for except for the employees who i have on second and third shift um, yeah. which runs three to 11 and 11 to seven Monday through Friday. So, so that's two dedicated employees. I have a second shift guy and a third shift guy. Um, so that would be their regular shift, but oh. anything outside of any of that, any weekend work, any holiday work, anything outside of seven to three is overtime per the union contracts. Okay. That's very helpful. And what I, so there were, I'm remembering a grant that was going to go toward uh, part of the generator. I'm, I'm worried about the generator. <laughs> generator, the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah that, that project is ongoing. That um, thing looked like, like a 1980s sci-fi movie or something. Before, you know? It just had like yeah, a lot exactly. of like lights yeah. and mechanical things that looked a little, so it's ongoing. Yeah. So it's, it's not like a one, like it's going to take a while of like replacing stuff. Right. Oh, it's going to take a while. Yeah, the, yeah, the generator okay. is still uh, in service. It's actually okay. like 1950s sci-fi movie. Yeah, 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 right. You know, the right. contractor has been mobilized and work is ongoing, but the generator is um, very much uh, still alive. Um, it, it has not yet been decommissioned. <laughs> you know, in, in terms of delays and plowing, I mean, what I would tell people is, you know, things are stable until I say they're not, you know, so right. it, it, in the event that, it, you know, what I would say is it is, it is always business as usual for us. Um, it, in the okay. event I lose, you know, a chunk of my department to some sort of COVID problem, you know, that's something that I would communicate to the mayor and, and that he would communicate um, to you folks. But, you know, my goal would be that all of this is um, completely opaque to the residents that whatever challenges we are having, you know, I deal with, um, the, I deal with them and, and nobody ever knows what those challenges are. I mean, I lost three people on Friday. We would have dealt with it this weekend and likely no one would have noticed at all. Um, you know, if I lose 13 people, that's a whole different conversation, you know, but, um, you, you know, I'm down, I have six vacancies right now. So I'm down six positions. I lose three people on top of that. Now I'm down nine positions, um, it, you know, so we have a little elasticity here, but uh, not an infinite amount, certainly. But, I, you know, I, I would never tell people we can't provide a level of service or keep the streets straight, safe unless I, unless I really mean it, you know, so it's, it's just more of a general conversation that, well, you know, if, in the event that something really catastrophic were to happen, yeah, we, we could have some problems, but the same could be said for, for any department, you know? Sure. Well, I'll just wait and see, you know, if, if it's, it's good to like, when you kind of have to, um, counsel people to be patient you know you have some idea why so I think it's helpful to know that but yeah I, I think it, it happens I, I'm in Leeds and um I am that microclimate and on Chesterfield Road and it, it's really I mean it's always I, you guys are amazing it's it's always faster than I think it's going to be so I actually don't know if I would notice <laughs> you know if, if, unless it was a significant delay so anyway good luck with it uh thank you director Thank you. Donna, I have a question for you, please. Um, you're saying that you have how many people on the weekend? 24 hours on the weekends. The yep. Weekend so I always, I, I always have one employee on duty on the weekends. So to, to, it's 24 hour coverage Saturday and Sunday. It's, it's just one person. Uh, unless I need to call in, you know, more based on weather conditions. I mean, this past Saturday, we had six people in salting the city. Um, but as a general rule, if, it, you know, the weather is clear, or there might just be a few icy spots here and there. I just have one person on duty. And that one person on duty is working how many shifts by himself or herself? So it's just an eight hour shift, one eight hour shift. And what they do is they check in with dispatch when they arrive and they check in with dispatch when they leave and they communicate with dispatch throughout the duration of their shift. You know, they'll say, oh, it's slippery on Chesterfield Road. You know, could you go sand or salt that? And, um, and typically I talk to them uh, at the beginning of their shift and tell them like, if I need them to do something special or I need you to pay attention to this particular place. 
I have to say they're excellent, especially in Ward 6. I mean, when it gets very, very slippery, we do call. They do come out and sand and so forth, whatever. They're excellent about that. Yeah, and when we mobilize the plow operation, as I mentioned, we have 49 plow routes. So all 49 drivers go to their route. And it, we, have, it, we have it split up so that, you know, it, it's as equal as possible. We don't want, you know, one person clearing, you know, 10 miles and, and someone else, you know, is only doing one mile. So we, we try to make it very equitable, you know, where there could run into problems is, you know, if we lose a truck. Um, or if we start losing multiple drivers, then we have to get coverage for that truck or coverage for those drivers. You know, that's where you could start to see like, oh, why is this taking so long? You know, that's when we might run into some difficulty. But as, as a general rule, it, you know, every area of the city is being plowed simultaneously. Okay, do we ever go outside? At one time we did, we would hire private companies to come in and help out. Do we still do that? Yeah, so that would be contract labor. That's not something that we typically do. We typically take care of this with our own employees and our own vehicles. Um, contractors are very, very difficult to come by, um, and, and particularly this year. Because right. um, so I know there was a problem, Donna, with that, because a lot of them decided to go and work with the state because they made more money. Well, and that's the challenge, you know, we, we have control over our internal operation. When you start contracting something out, that, that's less control over the operation. So that's not to say we haven't had really good contractors working for us, and, and often we do have good contractors working for us. But uh, generally, it, the, the bulk of these um, uh, plow routes are covered by internal city employees. Will this information go on your website, Donna? I think this information, much of this information is on our website. Okay. Um, right. We have a kind of a write up on our, of our snow and ice operations and snow emergencies and, and um, you know, the miles of roadway and so on and so forth. It, it is on the website. Okay. Thank you, Donna, very much. Councillor Foster, did you want to speak, please? Thank you, Councillor Labarge. Um, and Donna, thank you. Um, Really appreciate the overview. I just actually had one when you brought up the override. One other question that you addressed that day we went um, and took the tour with DPW, but I was wondering if you could just address it again to refresh my memory as well. One conversation that I heard about the override was um, about DPW employees who take vehicles home. And I understand that that's to be able to respond to emergency situations. Um, but if, if you could just give me like the, the quick who's taking trucks home and, and why that would be helpful. Yeah, so we, you know, are obviously running an operation that never shuts down. Um, so, it, you know, we have employees who are on call in all divisions. So water, sewer, streets for snow and ice operation or other streets problems. Um, and uh, forestry, meaning like if a tree falls in the road. so. Um, it is standard operating procedure for, um, you know, emergency response like this to be supplied with a pickup truck with uh, tools in it to respond to whatever the emergency is. So um, theoretically, if we had a water main break, um, I have an employee in the water division who is being paid to carry a pager um, to be available 24-7 and that employee would be in a vehicle with um, the, the, um, the tool to shut off the valve that would stop the water main break. So what we don't want is that employee driving by the water main break in their own vehicle um, to go get a city vehicle to then turn around and go back to the water main break and turn the valve. We, we want them to have the ability to respond and respond quickly in immediately to wherever the problem is. Um, many of our employees do not live, you know, in the city limits necessarily. So um, let's say there's a problem in Leeds and I have someone who has to drive through Leeds um, to get to, 
you know, our office at 125 Locust Street to get a truck to then double back and go to Leeds, obviously I'm losing time, you know, I'm losing response time. And, you know, the things we control have the ability to really destroy roads and houses and, and um, you know, a water main break can do a lot of damage in a very uh, short amount of time. So the people who are driving vehicles home are people who are responsible for emergency response and who we expect to have an availability 20, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to respond and respond fast. Um, and, and there are also contractual obligations that we have to these employees who, who are unionized. Um, but again, this is uh, standard. It, it's standard for utilities. It's standard for, you know, the power company, other municipalities, um, the gas company, um, you know, any, any company, if you will, that's, that's in charge of infrastructure like this uh, has an arrangement like this for the reasons I just stated. Thank you. That was really helpful. I guess anybody else like to speak? Any counselors? Very comfortable. Thank you. Donna, we all want to thank you very much for being here. We also want to thank you and all the employees of the Department of Public Works for working tirelessly. It's not been easy for any of us in the city of Northampton. So thank you very much for being here and giving us this great presentation. And thank all your employees from us counselors of all the good work that they are doing for all our residents in the city and for us as city councilors. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate beautiful it, tree. everyone. Yeah, I beautiful like tree. That's nice. Beautiful tree. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Reflection. Yeah. It's a nice like <laughs> shape. It's cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank okay, you. have a good thank night, you. everyone. Okay. So long. Thank you. Bye. Okay, items refer to committee. 20-145, appointments to Northampton Housing Authority and Housing Partnership. Um, housing Partnership, Ace, I think it's Taylor, 14 yep. Fruit Street, Apartment 1, Northampton, Mass. Um, term November 2020 through June 2023rd to fill a vacancy. And um, Councillor Quinlan, can you give us your report on your conversation with the applicant, Ace Taylor, please? I can. Uh, thank you very much, Councilor Labarge. Uh, so ACE was born in Colorado, but has been here in Northampton for about 10 years. Uh, they recently purchased a home here. Uh, so it was kind of a funny uh, feeling because uh, the idea originally was they felt that um, as a renter, they wanted to have more of the renter community here to feel like they were stakeholders and have a greater voice in Northampton. But then this, uh, all of a sudden, this opportunity came to purchase a home with some, some other people. Uh, and they did that. So uh, now they're a homeowner and a stakeholder that way. Uh, they did apply in March with a list of seven possible boards or committees to be involved in, and they're all centered on, on somehow helping others. Uh, ACE's intention of getting involved uh, somehow to better understand the local government and see opportunities uh, to put their skills to use was, was, was great. And we've talked about this before, but the other thing that, that I really liked about ACE was uh, Ace is 30 years old and wanting to be involved. So, you know, a relatively younger person. Uh, and, um, you know, it was really a, a very good conversation. And I felt that that Ace wanted to do this for all of the right reasons. Uh, and so with that uh, said, I would move a positive recommendation for Ace Taylor to join the Northampton Housing Partnership. Okay, second. So we have a motion and a second to forward the appointment. <laughs> of Ace Taylor to the Housing Partnership with a positive recommendation to Full City Council. Is there any discussion? If not, roll call, Laura. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Mayori? Yes. And Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Very cool. The, the next recommendation for appointment is Hannah. Schaefer, um, which is for Housing Partnership. She lives at 115 Milton Street, Florence. Her term, November 2020 through June 2023, to fill a vacancy. And Councillor Foster, um, could you please um, give us your report on your conversation with 
Hannah. Gladly. We had a great conversation um, last week. Um, Hannah, similar to ACE, and I think similar to many of the appointees that we've been seeing these last few months, which is really great, is, is younger. Um, Hannah's in her 30s, early 30s, and um, said to me that she's been really interested in getting involved locally for a while now. Um, she's been attending the housing partnership meetings as a renter. She's um, you know, very keenly aware of the challenges that are facing renters. Um, in particular, we talked about um, what's so commonly um, the steep, steep costs for moving in. Um, you know, as so many renters, not only do they need first, last, and security, but often um, a fee to the rental agencies as well. And that's something she was really uh, paying attention to. Um, hmm. And she sort of said to me, she's like, you know, I feel like our time is now, um, you know, people who are younger to step up and, and take a role in local government. And so that was really a, uh, I, I appreciated her view on that. Um, the other thing she's really interested in is what resources are available uh, for public housing, both to support existing public housing, as well as, you know, what opportunities may, be, may there be to provide additional public housing. Um, we talked about how Northampton is um, really such a desirable community for so many people to live in and yet um, out of affordable reach for so many. Um, and so public housing just has such a critical role to play in that. Um, yeah. And so with that, I would uh, move a positive recommendation um, for Hannah's appointment to the Housing Partnership. Second. We have a motion and a second to forward the appointment of Hannah Schaefer to the Housing Partnership with a positive recommendation to full City Council. Is there any discussion? If not, roll call, Laura. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. The motion is unanimous. The next recommendation is for Edgardo Cancel. And I will give my report on my com conversation with my applicant, Edgardo Cancel. Tim and I had a very lengthy talk on the phone. Um, he no longer lives at Hampshire Heights or Florence Heights. He lives in Ward 6 now on Indian Hill. He's a great guy. He is a former resident of, he was a former resident of Florence Heights and founder slash president of the Hampshire Heights Tenant Association. He has a lot of experience and an important perspectives to bring to the table when it comes to public housing matters in the city of Northampton. In most recent years, he was very instrumental in getting the Hampshire Heights community organized in collaboration with the Northampton Housing Authority and Healthy Hampshire to build a community garden on site. He also initiated the project and helped to secure funding for building a new playground in that community. On November 7th, 2020, we will also build a community garden at Florence Heights. And I don't know if they've started that or not. Over the years, with the help and support of the Northampton Housing Authority and other community organizations. He has organized yearly community block parties at both Florence Heights and Hampshire Heights. And needless to say, he, I am well known and regarded by residents of these two wonderful communities. I would love the opportunity to continue to serve and advocate for the public housing community by serving on the Northampton Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. I believe the Northampton Housing Authority management team and Board of Commissioners are doing an outside outstanding job in improving the quality of life of our city's low income community. And I would like to help continue that success by offering my expertise and personal experience as we move towards a more equitable and diverse city. He credits all of his success in building community to the amazing teachers, the mentors, the community leaders, and family members who came before him and who provided him with the tools and loving support needed over the years. He feels blessed to have grown up in the city of Northampton and to have been neutered and loved by so many. Therefore, my perfect my passion for serving the community comes from an abundance of gratitude and respect 
to those who taught him the way and the many who are still dedicating their lives to serving the people of this beautiful city. Respectfully, Edgardo Cancel, 37 Indian Hill, Florence, Mass. And I move forward the recommendation of Edgardo Cancel to the Northampton Housing Authority Board of Commissions with a positive recommendation to full city council. Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, just to say, you know, I had the pleasure of working with Edgardo over the, with the swing holes uh, this past summer. And yeah, I was, he's just a really gracious, um, upbeat kind of like troubleshooting problem solver. And it, oh, I, his, the backstory of growing up here is really interesting. And I'm, I'm really glad he's, he's uh, getting more involved in the, in the city government. Exactly. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Roll call, Laura. Sure. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. The motion is unanimous. Business. Um, we'll be meeting on January 4th. Is that the date okay for you councillors? If not, we can reschedule. I've already talked to Councillor Quinlan. He's fine with that date. I don't know if any of you other two counselors have anything going on with families or going away no. for the weekend. So we're no, all that's sorry. fine. I, sadly, I wish I had more going on, but you know, okay. a COVID <laughs> holiday, so I'm around. Okay. Same Thank here. You. This is it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, and also, we need to start thinking about what department that we would like to have come forth at our meeting on January 4th. And I know that we did invite um, the department head from the recreation department. And there was kind of a misunderstanding, I've been told. Um, something about um, she didn't have the um, password or whatever what was going on there, but that's fine. Uh, that's Would you like to have her come back January 4th from the rec department? I had another suggestion, but if someone wants to speak to that first. Because uh, I know Councilor Quinlan had suggested about oh. her coming, and that's why we try to book her for well, this month. Yeah, what, what, what's the other suggestion, Councilor Mary? Well, it was, right. I was just thinking with the, the first church's um, shelter. I'm not sure if that's, I don't know how much uh, that the building commissioner is going to be involved in that, but I'm just thinking in the winter and the warming centers, you know, I, there, I thought there was talk of a warming center at the senior center. I don't know if that is actually the building commissioner, I believe. Uh, so that's what I was thinking of, something related to the um, supervising the shelters. Um, but I guess I'll have to think about more who's actually doing all that. You know what, I think it might possibly be, I'm not sure, Laura. I know with Peg Keller, she handled like with ServiceNet um, they had the Grove Street Inn as a shelter for the whole summer, and also okay. um, the old Elks building on Center Street, they have the shelter there also through ServiceNet right next to the police station. I mean, we could get updates right. on that from somebody. In right, so it might be ServiceNet and not, you know, not a municipal body that's, um, but I would, yeah, I was just thinking about the, I get question, a lot of questions about um, how those shelters are, are operating and. Right. Well, we Chief, um, Chief Davin, I'm sorry to interject. Um, Chief Davin is involved in that. He's probably not the the, uh, the, the number one person, but I, I know that he's Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe uh, that's, that would, that's an interesting idea. Maybe that's somebody we should talk to. He's not though. Yeah, oh, okay. Do, um, do you want me to ask the mayor's office who it would be? I thought I'd read yeah. in the press release from the mayor's office that ServiceNet is operating the shelter and maybe the city was playing a supportive role of some type. So I'm not sure if there is I think an actual, true. but I could ask. Right. That'd but be you, great, Laura. I, yeah. If anyone else is interested, whatever. Right. I know for a fact Grove Street is, they all now own the Grove Street home because we used to own it. So that's a shelter that's being used also through service that we have the shelter right by the police station, the old Elks building. And we had a lot of involvement with that movement. So I don't know if 
probably I, I, Annie Lusco or somebody must be involved with working with the mayor in the city on the shelters. And right. I know that the mayor and other mayors are all getting together to try to find an area for the homeless people that don't have homes and don't have a place to be warm during the night. So I think that's a very good question, but I also would like to have um, Anne Marie Mosho come in, if you can get her to come in in January and we can have her for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then also let's go ahead and let's find out about these shelters. And if we can get that done, let's book it. There's no reason why we can't. I can just tell them that you'd like to learn more about the operation of the homeless shelter and you know who would be the best person to speak to that. Exactly. Let, I'll let you know. When you're saying right. homeless shelters, keep in mind, we have the Grove Street home right. and we also have the one by the police station. So that's two right there. The Edwards Church, I'm, I, I don't know about that or First Church, I'm not sure, but I know they're all trying to combine together to help us out in any way that we can. We stamp them the same way. So this is a very good question, Councilor. Um, other, and, I, and I think we should look at this and I think we should have them come in in January and do a follow-up of where we're standing and where are our homeless people gonna be sheltered. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you, um, Councilor Barge. The other kind of, it, th th this isn't doesn't have to be soonish, but um, I thought about Marie Westerberg. I, I was thinking about seniors. I was on a call with seniors and a lot of seniors are kind of feeling lonely. And I, I guess I have some questions about, the, you know, maybe in the sp early spring or something when the vaccines are rolling out, I, I would be interesting to talk uh, at some point with um, Marie Westberg from the yeah, Senior we Center. See how it's working to have the, AD, the, the disability, you know, that, that change, if that's working. I don't know. That's just someone else, but I think the one the ones you mentioned are are more you know are, are probably more pertinent right now. But. Right, we could bring so, in Marie Westberg, probably yeah. around in March or so. Whatever. Yeah, That's maybe I think that would be good. Kind yeah. of just see how it's going, keeping seniors connected virtually. Right. I know the Northampton neighbors have been excellent also. Yeah, they're great. I was on their call right. this and morning. That's why I thought of it. We should connect with and bring them in. Oh, I mean, they're wonderful. And Linda Desmond, of course, is the ex. Um, I know. She's running the, she runs the Florence Northampton neighbors and she's yes. the ex, um, head of the senior center. Yeah. But they're doing, yeah, they're doing a lot to try to connect when they hear seniors are feeling lonely from, you know, having to quarantine and right. they're doing a lot around that. So I think that would be. I yeah, think that's Kathy, great. Isn't Kathy Service also on that board? Yes, I believe. I, yes, there's a I'm bunch of sure. great people on that. Yeah. The only thing about Northampton Neighbors, I'm a huge fan. I love them, um, but they're not a city department, so I don't right. know if they fall outside of our of our purview. Oh, I know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I guess they could speak to working with city departments, but I don't. Maybe if we got Marie Westberg first, we kind of understand, you know, how that's how they interact and over overlap. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? We just heard Councillor Foster stating, well, they're not in our pre -book. Well, we just brought in a speaker last time. True. Okay. <laughs> so I have a problem with that. Yeah. So I think we could ask, which Laura can ask the mayor, if we could bring in Northampton neighbors and let's get educated by them. What have they been doing for our elders? And like Councillor Miora is saying, the safety part of it, being lonely in that, I don't see, I don't see harm to that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fine with me, whatever you, you all What do you me. think, Councillor Foster? I guess I'm uncertain. Um, I, I I agree. Um, you know, I, I would love to hear more about North, what Northampton Neighbors is doing. I know that when we invited Sarah Bankert in to talk to us, it was because of the direct relationship right. to the city department and boards and commissions. Um, that being said, it's not that I don't want to invite Northampton Neighbors in, absolutely, but perhaps in partnership with the senior center or um, or start there. I, I'm just wondering if Northampton Are Neighbors also. Counselor, are you saying because they're in partnership with the senior center? No, they're they're not in partnership with the senior center, oh, but I, I know that they support support the senior center. Um, but I'm wondering if we should start with the senior center. I guess is is oh, that's fine. Yeah, that's a good know. idea. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah. 
Okay, so Laura, will you check that out, please? Especially the shelters, that's number oh, one, right? right, and maybe I'll wait till later, till after the next meeting to inquire about the senior center since that's still months away or? Yes, yeah, yeah. the most important thing right now is the shelters. And if we could have that scheduled for January 4th, correct, Councilor Maiori? Would you like that? Yeah, I, yeah, I would. Counselors? That sounds I'll good. ask tomorrow and let you know what they say. Okay. And also check it out with um, Anne Marie. If we can get her to yes. come in here on January 4th for about 15 sure. minutes or so. I'll I make sure to send her a Zoom link. Yeah, because <laughs> I think her schedule might be a heavy one too. Okay. Right. And I think, you know, if they're thinking ahead, not to overwhelm us, but I was thinking when they roll out those vaccines in like March and April, we might want to talk to the health department again about that. Uh, it's going to be a really uh, complex operation, it sounds like, right, from our talk on Thursday. Oh. That's a while we should, you know, we don't, that's the earliest, uh, you know, that they'll be doing a citywide um, service like that. The councils are going in order of their ward, though, so you're at the end of the line. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to turn that seven into a one. <laughs> do that. Well, according to the New York Times, there's um, 286 million people in line in front of me. So <laughs> yes, I did that today too. <laughs> Ward two. <laughs> you can pick me up in your bicycle. <laughs> I will. I'll give you a ride, Councilor Labarge. <laughs> <laughs> I love the bikes they have. Okay. I'm going to just fall in front of her and get a shot first. So. All right, so we need one final motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Roll call, Laura. Sure. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Goodbye, everybody.